Hey guys, CP Morty here, back with another video, and today we take a look at the Huawei P9. So after a year and a new model has been released, should you still be considering the P9 as a daily driver? Now for this video, I'll be rocking a red and black skin provided by Dbrand and I'll drop a link down below if you would want to grab one for your own phone. So kicking things off with specifications, for those of you who don't remember or never really cared at launch, we are rocking a high silicon Kirin 955 CPU, which is Huawei's own design that has been paired up with the Mali T88 GPU and we've also also too got a whopping 4 gigabytes of RAM. On paper this is a powerhouse of a phone but it doesn't really translate into reality which is a little bit of a letdown. Speaking of letdowns, the rear camera is also too a little bit of a letdown. Whilst it is a 12 megapixel shooter on the back that is supposedly Leica certified, the only thing that I could find that was really Leica about it was the font in the application of the camera. The cameras themselves are actually made by a third party manufacturer known known as Sunny Optical Technology of China, and everything else is done by Huawei. Both companies say that they had their hands in the design, but from seeing the website that what Sunny Optics actually offers, it looks like more of a rebrand than actually a redesign. So if you were going to be buying this phone for the Leica cameras, don't. Continuing on with the trend of meh kind of specs, we are looking at ourselves those aforementioned cameras that are 12 megapixels and only record 1080p video that honestly looks like the worst 1080p out there, which we'll touch on a little bit later in this video in the camera section. There's also two or 3000 milliamp hour battery on board with a very small 5.2 inch display, which is running at 1080p. This makes for some really decent battery life, but if you are moving from a much larger phone, this will take quite a bit to adjust to. There's also two 32 gigabytes or 64 gigabytes of onboard storage with micro SD expansion, which is super nice to see, and overall a really nice construction. Speaking of that construction, the build of the phone is actually rather impressive. With an all aluminium body and glass front with a visor up the top of the back of the phone, this phone feels really solid and very premium in the hand. The subtle curves and clean chamfers remind me very much of the Nexus 6P from Huawei, and that rear fingerprint scanner is definitely on point. The buttons are also too very tactile and overall everything fits into place and is a very well built phone and honestly really smashes it out of the park. In my time using the phone I never once hit a wrong button and that fingerprint scanner was so fast it even blows something like the Nexus 6P and 5X out of the water. Within milliseconds of putting your finger on that sensor the phone is already woken up and unlocked and you're into the device itself. A really, really nice experience. Some may comment, however, on that visor, but once you throw a skin over the top, honestly, it isn't too much of a bad issue. Being a phone, I guess we better also to touch on call quality. Calls are good, and I never experienced a drop call, and everyone was able to hear me clearly, and I was also too able to hear them as well, not half that bad. I do want to point out, though, at high volumes, both the earpiece and the bottom speaker when in loudspeaker mode do start to distort, which can make for a bit of a terrible experience, but overall, in most day-to-day -day uses, call quality was excellent, and overall I heard them no problems. Browsing and data speeds were also too good, but will depend on your area. I was in an area which supported 4G plus speed, so everything was very, very fast compared to our home internet connection. However, I did find when out in the middle of nowhere, where there was lower signal quality, I just could not pick up any strength. Something that is totally fine if you live in cities and metropolitan areas, but if you live out in the middle of nowhere where you would generally get a low signal strength, you may have a bit of a problem here. Same thing if you were to put a metal case on this phone, what I did find when putting any sort of case with any pieces of metal on it was it did degrade the actual strength of both Wi-Fi and also to the cellular connection. Personally running a skin I don't have much of a problem, but if you were to put something like the metal aluminium bumper cases on them, you will start to notice a bit of a signal loss. But overall, decent strength, decent call quality and very fast speeds. Software wise on this phone is in a little bit of a situation 
situation. For unlocked carryless phones, you are up on the latest edition of EMUI. However, for those of you who are on a carrier like me, we are stuck on EMUI 4.1.1. And the upgrade to the latest edition of EMUI looks pretty grim. Software is just not up to date on this phone and the latest security patch I've received for this phone was September of 2016. By the time I'm releasing this video, close to six months old. The stock EMUI launcher is straight up my least favorite on the market. I'd rather take Samsung's TouchWiz from three years ago when they were still running Jelly Bean any day over EMUI. The notifications on the lock screen are also too fundamentally broken and once you log into the system, you can find that you've got a bunch of notifications, but when you lock the phone, none of them show up on the lock screen, even if lock screen notifications are enabled. Then, once you log into the phone and start using the notification shade, you'll also to notice a really big problem. Well, we find that once we log in and pull down that notification shade, there are notifications and shortcuts. If we want to get to shortcuts, we just swipe over, but if you have a full notifications plane, you'll be dismissing notifications rather than swiping over. Yes, you could go up to the top and just tap on shortcuts or notifications, but that is out of the way and a whole lot harder to do than just swiping straight across. I'm not sure why EMUI can't detect the difference between swiping to shortcuts and swiping away a notification, but it really does bug me. However, with that being said, the latest version of EMUI has this problem fixed where it's more like stock Android and you just pull down a second time to get to the shortcuts menu, but something that I really just don't like about this phone. As I did mention a little bit earlier, the stock EMUI launcher is absolutely rubbish. If we take a look at it, there is no app draw and everything just gets thrown onto the main home screen. It's a little bit convoluted and honestly, really just doesn't do a good job at it. Personally, after one hour of using the phone, I went ahead and just threw Google Now Launcher over the top of it and it works so much better. Having the app drawback is so much more handy and just having an overall cleaner and a more aesthetically pleasing looking phone is, well, again, a lot more pleasing. The final main gripe I do have with EMUI is just how much it has its fingers into every part of the phone. For example, the settings application is very much customized and well things do get a little bit lost. So you want to go ahead and change some power settings or look for the battery icon, you have to go through multiple sub menus to even get to anything related to power and energy saving. Not really my favorite thing but at the end of the day that is what it is. Now speaking of that power and battery, in terms of charging we are rocking a USB-C connection for super fast charging. It is really really fast and I can plug my phone in for about half an hour to an hour and get almost a full charge out of it. Really really awesome. When you're not charging this phone absolutely sips power and the only time I ever ran it out of power in one day was when I was recording the day in the life of the CP Mod video which you can find linked in the description box. The reason why it ran out of power that day was I was filming with it for quite a long time and I was also too doing a lot of tethering and hotspotting, basically eating up all the battery. But from day to day usage, even though I'm a fairly heavy smartphone user, I have no problems getting through an entire day with more than 40% battery left in it at the end of the day at about 11 o'clock at night. Whilst that is good, Huawei's power saving mode on this phone is so aggressive that if you don't change any of the actual settings, it will just kill everything in the back. Background. For reference, when I first set up this phone and started using it, I thought the Gmail app was actually broken because I was getting no notifications and no emails unless I was in the app actually manually refreshing it. What it turned out was actually EMUI was killing Gmail when I wasn't using it. So if I switched over to YouTube or just locked the phone entirely, the whole process of running Gmail would be shut down to save power. Whilst it again did save a lot of power, it meant that I got no notifications on emails and even some Something as simple as Hangouts wouldn't even send me a notification because it was shut down when EMUI thought I wasn't using the phone. Again, it is super aggressive and saves a ton of power, but in terms of data usability, it really, really is difficult. Once you do jump through all the settings and make sure you find everything and enable all the applications, it actually becomes a whole lot usable. But there is still that little bit of power saving here and there. For example, if I do watch a movie on the phone or watch a really long YouTube video, I'll actually find that the phone kills the launcher in the background. So if I hit the home button, I do have to wait five to 10 seconds for the launcher to reopen and actually allow me to go to the home screen. Something I've never had a problem with on any other phone, but is apparent on this particular phone. And jumping into camera, this was really 
one of the selling points for Huawei. They were teaming up with Leica to make a dual camera system that actually supposedly produced much better images. And honestly, it doesn't. Whilst it does offer things like raw photo recording and a ton of different modes including a monochrome mode inside of the stock applications photo app, it really doesn't bring anything new to the market that a third party application could actually bring. For example, on just about every other Android phone that I've been running that has the new camera API on it, I usually run an application known as ProShot. Whilst I don't need to run it with this phone, it offers exactly the same functionality as what the stock app actually offers. Now granted, image quality is extremely nice out of this phone, but when comparing it to other high-end flagship phones, it honestly isn't anything that special. And in terms of video quality, it is absolutely rubbish. For example, here's a shot out of the HTC One M7 and the Huawei P9, which I haven't marked, so either one could be either camera. We all know that the HTC One M7 didn't have any amazing image quality by any standards when it launched or even by today. And I can say, side by side comparison, it is extremely hard to tell the difference in terms of video quality out of the M7 versus the P9. And here are the two different ones. Let me know down below if you could guess the difference, but honestly, they are extremely similar. And just as a quick comparison, here is video out of my Panasonic GH5, and here is video out of my Huawei P9, and there is no comparison. Even if I set that GH5 down into actual 1080p mode, there is still no comparison here at all. Whilst photos can rival those taken on a DSLR, at the end of the day, even though Huawei's marketing is all about how awesome this camera is, it does come down to the photographer who's behind the camera rather than the hardware itself. You can take a single camera setup from something like a Samsung Galaxy S7, S8 or any other high-end smartphone on the market and you'll get as good or even better image quality in the photo department and you'll even get 4K video whilst doing so. So in terms of image quality out of this guy, whilst it is good, it comes down to the person taking the photos, editing the photos and overall doing everything with it. Which leads us to the final biggest problem with this phone and that is the Huawei P10. The next generation of the phone is already out so that doesn't really make much sense to buy this guy. If you are in the market for a new P9, should you consider this guy? Well, simply no. There's already a successor to this guy that actually addresses a lot of my complaints with this phone and there's simply much better options. If you are buying this guy just for the fact that it has dual Leica cameras, you may want to take a look into the actual manufacturer as this is Sunny Optics and really Leica had nothing more to do with this than actually allow Huawei to actually go ahead and just use their font on their application. Whilst the hardware is absolutely stunning, fits in the hand really well and overall is a very nice phone, the software does let it down big time. If you are thinking about this phone, think about grabbing the P10 because it's going to be a much better experience and overall this phone just doesn't really deliver. So there we have it, the Huawei P9. At its time, a really interesting phone with a fairly decent camera setup, however in the video department it really gets let down there. The build is awesome, the fingerprint scanner is awesome and the touchscreen is very very nice, however again the software and the cameras which are two major selling points for this phone do let it down and the P10 is overall just a much better device. Thanks guys for watching and let me know what you think of the Huawei P9. Do you think the cameras are just as good as what Leica wants them to be or do you think that it was a little bit of a letdown having Leica branded gear when there wasn't really any Leica hardware under the hood? Thanks again for watching and I'll see you next time for another video.